Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. Actually, as I walked in, someone said, oh, let me get you your name tag. And I was like, no, no, I'm, I'm faculty. So <laughs> even uh, at my age, you still get put in your place. Um, I have the slides, I guess. Let's see. So um, as Dr. Um, Humphrey uh, and said, I have a lot of different titles. So um, my question or my title for you is what does diversity, contraception, and games uh, equal? Um, and sort of what I do. So um, I love this picture. This is um, somewhere in there is my mom um, on a sunny Sunday in uh, Kentucky. And at the very top somewhere is my grandfather, who's the pastor of this church. And um, it's such a moment in time for me. It's a time um, when, you, when uh, the world was more segregated, uh, when um, people had just made uh, the beginning of a migration north. Um, and a time, actually, in my mom's own life when her father was still alive. He died when she was about 14. And for me, this is um, life without diversity, but it's also about the potential of young people as they're in loving families and supportive communities. This is many uh, years later, actually, I think my mom's about 25 uh, or 26 there, um, and she's a reporter at the Washington Post, and she was the first uh, woman, African-American woman reporter at the Washington Post. And so um, there's an example of her diversifying, and um, I really believe in diversity. I think there's something um, really special about her presence there, how it affected the newsroom. She told me when she went to um, ask for maternity leave um, at at the time my older sister was born, they said, maternity, what? I mean, they really did. And some of the men said, well, oh, I'd like to have that too. And they said, you know, Dorothy, that's too complex. Why don't you just come back to work? And so she had to leave for a few years, and then she went back eventually. But um, to be a woman in the workplace at that time was, was really complex. Um, this. Uh, is my father, he's, uh, he's an artist, and he was born in Mississippi, and he's also an example of that great migration uh, north, northward. And um, this idea, I still think about it, how does someone decide to be an artist when you grow up really, really poor in Mississippi? Where does that come from? Um, but it's something he's done all of his life. He's raised uh, successful children, a uh, robust family. He's um, and he's very well known. So how, how does that process happen? And so I've been very interested in what individuals do, the growth and trajectories of individuals, but also the systems, um, whether those are those sort of micro systems, your family or those more macro, your community or the society that make those possible. Um, this is a cover of a book about Lyndon Johnson, who I just, I find presidents fascinating. I'll like read colonial history, but I also find him in particular fascinating. And I don't know if you've uh, read this series of books by uh, Robert Caro. Um, this Lyndon Johnson is a terrible human being in many, many ways. Um, but one of the things that he did, um, you know, personal life, you, you know, you would never want to be married to him, but. Um, <laughs> But one of the things he did, and my mom talks about this, is when she came of age, right at the 60s, was right at the time when he made these huge systemic changes, from everything to getting a Voting Rights Act passed, but also a war on poverty, so that not only she had sort of the buttressing of her community, but systems began to change. Things were desegregated, the ability to vote, so that she said when that window opened, she was able to walk through. And so that's a combination, that's what I see in diversity, this idea of changing systems so that people who are capable can walk through because when they come, the, the diversity of thought and opinion that we can create a, to take on a problem is incredibly important. So these are my people. Um, I'm what's called a pediatric and adolescent gynecologist. Um, and so um, I'm very interested in adolescents and that, uh, and so much that they have to offer. And it's such a great field because um, I uh, perform surgery, I have a medical component, and then there's sort of this deep uh, psychosocial component as you work with families. And so um, this is this trajectory that I'm really interested in and in watching um, young people grow up. 
when I, um, and I took a sort of a circuitous uh, route. I um, sort of was an English major and studied philosophy and politics and then uh, tried to stint as, general, as a general surgeon but then eventually ended up in OBGYN because I really thought that this trajectory um, and this and the process of reproduction and birth was such an important part of people's lives. And so for me, um, teen pregnancy has really been this issue. Um, if you have people with so much potential and then they become pregnant, it really alters their lives. And it's such an important health disparity. It disproportionately affects African Americans and Latinos and given people who are already disproportionately affected by poverty to add this additional um, issue into their lives really decreases their long-term trajectories. And you can see sort of parallel things. These are uh, rates of STDs, and again, um, very, very high rates among our youngest people. And so for me, uh, reproductive health has really been at the core of addressing um, issues. Now I took pediatrics and adolescent gynecology and combined it with family planning because it seemed like such a, uh, it is such an important biomedical um, approach for um, really helping young people prevent these highly preventable uh, problems. And um, I'm sort of a activist, and so this is the other part I love about family planning is that it has this whole social political component um, so that you can address issues and uh, really talk about um, issues that are um, important. And it's really an important role for a physician because you can be a person who advocates for um, these topics. So I've always thought that if we avoid teen pregnancy and HIV and STDs, then these young people will go to college and then we're done, right? It's, and I think that was very much the story of my parents. You know, education was such an important part, and I think we can, everyone in this room can also say education is a critical part of who they are. But um, this is uh, a delivery board um, in Uganda. I, can't remember the year, about 2004. And um, this is very common in OBGYN. You, come, uh, lab, you go down to labor and delivery, you look at the delivery board, and you say what happened that night and what's gonna ha what are we going to do for the day. And this was our morning report. We All the doctors went down, and we were looking at um, what happened overnight. Um, and so if you look closely, um, typically like we would have breaches, some multiple births. But then they have um, the number of stillborns. And just in one night, there were uh, four of them. And then they had this thing, MSB, um, macerated stillbirths. Um, so that means the baby had died uh, so long ago that the skin had started to sort of fall off. It was macerated. So there were four of those. Um, there were six pre uh, preeclampsic. There was two who had eclamptic seizures, and so on and so forth. They talk about uh, se severe anemia, ruptured uteruses. So in the developing world, all of these things happen in just one night in one hospital. This is Chicago, and so in some places, um, people experience that upper Chicago. Um, but this is um, a high rise in Chicago. Um, and I always think about it because I, one of my earliest studies was of adolescent mothers. I did a big biomedical intervention study, um, and I tried to follow them. And they would say things like, well, I'm on the 10th floor of Cabrini Green. We have no elevator. I couldn't get to my, uh, post, my postpartum appointment. Um, so what I realized from that board in Uganda and here in Chicago, that these structural problems uh, of neighborhoods, of transportation, of poverty, really affect health. In my study, I had uh, designed an in-clinic study. It was sort of, uh, you know, I used focus groups and I did all the right things, but it was delivered in clinic. And um, when I tried to see why they didn't follow up, I followed the patient rather than just by schedule for the day. I realized what patients actually go through trying to get in to see me. If I hadn't done that, I'd just say, well, you know, finish my day of work. Um, but when I went home and actually went and saw the way that patients lived, I realized, oh, we're missing a, a lot of the picture, and a lot of our interventions may be limited. So um, 
this is sort of another way of looking at it, um, and this is from one of my colleagues in economics, but it basically shows that the gross domestic product actually affects life expectancy. And so um, you can have countries that, um, and this is sort of the way that trajectory is supposed to go, and then you have countries where, despite the gross domestic product, product um, the life expectancy is really low. And so these sort of systems, this poverty and inequality is a real driver of health. Um, as I started to put all these thoughts together, um, I began to do what I think is so quintessential to the University of Chicago. I started to find colleagues who might be able to help me address some of the problems that I was thinking about at a different level. This is sort of the, the map I made of all the people I wanted to talk to on campus. But it gives you a sense of <laughs> how rich um, our campus is. And um, I did medical school at Harvard, and we were all the way across. The medical campus was all the way across uh, the city from Cambridge. I'm across Ellis Avenue, so I have a real tactical advantage. Um, and so what I did was I brought people together much like this in a room like uh, you are, and we started to ask um, what type, how could we begin to work? How can we transform sexual and reproductive health here? And could we at the University of Chicago have the capacity to do something different? Um, and I ended up starting an interdisciplinary center, um, which is actually on the other side of Ellis, across the street from my kids' school. So it's always, you know, again, a beautiful thing about the University of Chicago is that um, it's very convenient. Um, and what we've begun to do is put together very unusual partnerships to address what I think are really um, just kind of age-old and trans transigent problems uh, to do with human health. And um, I have a particular interest in youth development. And instead of working uh, with young people in just a clinical setting, I've begun to work in settings more like this. This is a collaborative team of, um, this is a professor in the English department, um, some staff, some students from um, our local community. And we're actually designing a game that has to do with health. Um, this is another picture of our workshop. So we use lots of different uh, media and other approaches. And one of the core pieces are narratives. So um, I think as clinicians, we hear a lot of narratives, right? We always ask patient's story, what brings you here? But it's a really structured narrative. What we're working on is thinking about narrative from these young people's lives. And what I've started to hear is the role that violence and parent parental loss and um, other problems, how much that affects their lives and the choices they're making. So it's not just I didn't take that birth control pill because I forgot, but really these major, major drivers of human health. Um, this is one game that uh, we uh, developed. And um, oh, there's another one. Um, and this ended up being a card game that we're now um, using as a basis of a curriculum in an eighth grade classroom. So um, that's a long trajectory, um, but that is uh, my most recent uh, series of thoughts and thought patterns. And it brings you about uh, where I am now and what I'm doing. Um, so if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. <laughs>